Thank you, Hank, for reminding us that we need to roll up our sleeves and get to work. As I think about that, that thought of rolling up our sleeves and getting to work, some questions creep into my mind. What do we do when the work is hard? And what more are we supposed to do when the work seems daunting and that we just can't do it? It feels like we're entering a wilderness. A wilderness we as a church have not entered into for 27 years. And how in the world do we continue from here? These questions that circulate in my mind, and I think if we're honest, may be circulating in, in, in all of our minds this morning, they're legitimate, and they can be overwhelming. Now, they're a healthy part of a transition process. We need to ask these questions. But left alone, they can become deteriorating and destructive and divisive. In times such as these, I think God makes clear that we need to remember why we have been called, why we are Calvary Baptist Church, why we live out the calling God has placed in our lives. And we need to remember why God is not finished with us yet. Now, I have a confession this morning. Apart from just a time of transition, there are times in my life when I need to be honest that I need to sit down and remember why I do this crazy thing called ministry. And that comes up in a lot of different forms and areas. Why has God called me to be a minister? And if you talk to some of my colleagues that'll look at me and say, why in the world has God called you to work with youth? Are you crazy? And now I know that my calling is a deep, integral part of who God has created me to be. But there are still days when doubts and questions creep into my mind. Now those days of doubting and questioning, they're good for me, but I don't like to dwell there. I don't like to stay there for very long. Now, my awesome wife, Abby, knew that I would have days such as these. Days when I would question and ask, why in the world am I ministering? Why in the world do I feel this call to be in the church? And to help with that, Abby collected and put together a resource for me that I can go back to quite often. It usually sits on my bookshelf in my office, and it's the title, where I get the title for my sermon today, and you'll see it up here on the screens. It's a book from my ordination service. And the title of the book says, When You Need to Remember Why. Contained within these pages are memories from my ordination service, pictures of former youth, mentors, and friends. But Abby also collected thoughts and words from different people who had participated in the service as well. Now, if you were present just a few weeks ago for Bob's uh, retirement party that we had, I shared the words that Dr. Baker had shared with me, which are also contained here and actually right there on that page. But my favorite words in the entire book are found on the very first page, and they come from Abby. Abby wrote, quote, The purpose of this book is to be an encouragement to you on days when ministry is hard. Look back at this book and remember why you do it. You know, Abby was right. There are days when ministry is tough. From minor issues of plans falling through or events not going the way that I hoped they would or difficult conversations come up to the passing of long-standing pillars of our faith community to diagnoses we never hoped we'd hear. And if we're honest with ourselves today, ministry is tough when the person who has shepherded us for the past 27 years has retired and is no longer with us. Today is a hard day for ministry. Not just for me, but I think for all of us. But we need to take a breath and stop. There's grieving in our congregation today. And it's legitimate. There are doubts and they too are legitimate, and there is worry, and that is legitimate as well. But we can't just dwell there. We have to continue pushing on, and sometimes we need to be reminded of why. Why we do this crazy thing called church. Why we are Calvary Baptist. Why we minister to the community here in Lexington, and why we continue to push on during a time of transition. 
Now, this is going to come as a complete shock to you, but we are by no means the first church that's ever dealt with these questions. And we will by no means be the last church that will deal with these questions in times of transition. This morning, the story that Taylor has read for us, I think, shows an example of a community well before churches were even established. A small group of people who had been following a shepherd for just a few short years. And when he was gone, that community was left scrambling, trying to figure out what would come next. We find the disciples scattered and frantic. They had just been told about Jesus being laid to rest in the tomb, that Roman soldiers were guarding the tomb, that no one could go and be in that place. They had left their homes, their families, everything to follow this man, and now he was gone. They had nothing. What in the world were they supposed to do now? Now, one of my favorite disciples is Peter, and I can kind of hear Peter in this setting with the other disciples sitting around and saying, oh, okay, y'all, we, we, we've still got to do things. Like, we, we can still do this. It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. But I can also hear the other disciples looking at Peter, who's, you know, my, my favorite because he's lovable, but he messes up quite a bit. And I can hear the other disciples looking at Peter and being like, didn't you just deny Jesus like three times the other day? We don't want to hear this from you, Peter. Stop talking. I can only imagine the fighting, the frustration and pain that must have been felt among that early group of followers of Jesus. Questions had to abound. How in the world we, will we continue to go on? Now, my favorite part of the story happens right before the verses that Taylor read for us this morning. While the disciples, while some of the disciples are gathered together trying to figure out and talk through what their next actions are, we find two of Jesus' followers putting action and words into action. We find Mary and the other Mary, as scripture says, making their way to the tomb. They decided that it was enough time for talking and it was time for action. Early in the morning, both of these early church leaders made their way to the tomb and a little bit of a spoiler alert for you, not to give away Easter. But when they showed up to the tomb, the stone was rolled away and it was empty. Jesus was not there. And so we see Mary and Mary, the first evangelists that we see in Scripture, running and telling everyone that Jesus has risen. He is risen indeed. As they went to go tell their fellow disciples this wonderful news, as so often happens, rumors began to spread. That followers of Jesus came in the middle of the night and stole his body away and were lying to everyone about his raising from the dead. The guards at the tomb had been paid off and were told not to say a word. The religious leaders were quick to put to rest any idea that Jesus might actually be alive again. The small little glimmer of hope that existed amongst the disciples was quickly fading. And I can hear the community around them. I can hear their taunts coming toward the disciples. Y'all can't keep following Jesus. He's not really alive. How are you going to go on without the person who's been leading you? What are you going to do now? And as they walked away, looking over their shoulder back at the group of scattered and frantic disciples, I can hear their mocks saying, good luck. Talk about a roller coaster of emotions for those first followers of Jesus. Thankfully, they didn't allow those fears and doubts and concerns from their community and their own concerns to stop them from seeking Jesus. Now, I love how Matthew's gospel ends here. The disciples are gathered together in Galilee, and Jesus appears to them and commissions them to keep going, baptizing, teaching, and doing the work for which they have been called. Now, that all sounds great. We refer to those verses at the Great Commission. I think most of us know those verses by heart in some way, shape, or form. But there's a little piece that, if we're careful, we miss in this story. And it comes in verse 17. When they, the disciples, gathered together, when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. They gathered together and worshipped Jesus, but there was still doubt in their midst. The resurrected Jesus is in front of them. 
and they still worry if they can do this work that God has called them to. And before we hear a response from the disciples, before Peter gets a chance to say something silly as he often does, the gospel ends. If Matthew's account were the only one we had, it would seem we would never know the resolution to the story. But it's not entirely true. We do know the resolution to the story. Those early followers of Jesus, full of doubt and questions, listened to this crazy idea of going into the world and telling people about Jesus. Baptizing, teaching. How do we know that? Well, we're gathered this morning in a church that is a testament to the hard work and discipleship of those early church leaders. Because of the work of our founding church mothers and fathers, we are gathered here worshiping the risen Christ. When they had every reason to quit and give up, they pushed on, knowing that God had something else in store for them. I'm sure they had moments when they needed to remember why, and if you need any proof of that, go read any of Paul's letters to the early church. They often needed to be reminded of why they were together in community and why they continued to press on to do God's work. Now, church, we got to be honest with ourselves this morning, too. The work for which we are called to do is difficult. To be light and love in a world of darkness and hate is tough. That job gets even harder when we enter a time of transition and an interim. Fears creep in and our anxiety can cripple us and it can take us over. How in the world are we going to follow through with the work to which we've been called when we don't have someone to lead us? Well, I want to offer a few suggestions on how we continue to do this work to which God has called us. First, we've got to block the outside noise. Just as our early church mothers and fathers heard the outside noise of people accusing them of saying they stole Jesus' body, just as they heard all the doubts and fears and concerns of that community and the words for which would have torn them apart, we've got to block that out and continue to follow the path for which God has called us. To be more specific on that, when, and not if, but when, when we hear people asking what is going to happen now that we are without a senior pastor, and when someone asks what the future of Calvary looks like, we've got to block out the negative and hurtful responses that could come so easily. But we have answers to those questions, right? What does it look like now that we don't have a pastor? Well, we're going to begin our search for the person God has already started to call. And what does our future look like? It's the same future and plan we sought after since the very beginning. To fulfill our calling to be love and light in our world day in and day out, that does not change. We are still called to do God's work, and that is never changing. Second, we've got to work together, y'all. Those early church leaders had some issues with each other. Again, read Paul's letters. They fought a lot. They certainly didn't get along on every little thing. And that was okay. During this time of transition and interim, we have to stay together. We can disagree, we can work out our issues, but we cannot and should not fight with one another and tear each other apart. We must be connected and work together to continue being the love and the light that God has called us to be. And lastly, and this may be the hardest part of all this, and it's a reminder of what Hank has already called us to remember this morning too. We gotta actually do the work. We can talk about it, but we actually gotta do it. However long we are without a pastor, however long we are in this interim, whatever the case may be, we have to keep being Calvary Baptist Church. We have been called to continue to share God's love with our community and to the world. And that work does not stop. Now sure, that work's going to be different without Dr. Baker here. And that doesn't mean it's going to be a bad different. But we still have plenty of work to do. Ministry from this day on at Calvary is going to be different. There are going to be days when we need to remember why we are Calvary Baptist Church, why we continue to push on, why we continue to roll up our sleeves and to do this amazing work for the kingdom of God for which we have all been called to do. And I hope that you will take time to look back at the ending of Matthew's gospel and that these verses will serve as a reminder that God is not finished with us yet and that we still have work to be done. 
Now, I want to leave us with a visual reminder as well. Now, we don't have the time or the resources or the money to put together one of these really cool books that Abby put together for me for my ordination for everyone in here. But I do want to leave you with a visual reminder, something as we gather together during our times of worship each Sunday, you will be able to look to and see as a as a physical reminder that God has still called us to do this amazing work, to be love and light in our community, and that we are to go do it. Another one of the gifts I received at my ordination was this stole. This stole signifies to me that I have been called and set apart for the work for which God has called me to do. Stoles are often used in other denominations to mark certain times within the church calendar year, Easter, Christmas, Lent, Epiphany, so on. But I want this stole to be a reminder to us that God has called us and set us apart to do this wonderful and amazing work, to be love and light in our community and around the world, to share Jesus with all those that we encounter. And may it be a reminder to us that there is still plenty of work to be done And may we go do it, knowing that God is with us. So let's roll up our sleeves. And when it gets tough and we need to remember why, may we remember that God has called us and set us apart to do it. Would you join me in prayer? Loving and gracious God, may you continue to bless us with foolishness. Even when others say we can't go on without a pastor, even when others doubt and are worried about the future, even when the work seems hard and we are not sure we can do it, God, continue to bless us with just enough foolishness to believe that we really can make a difference in our world, that we can do what others claim cannot be done, to do justice, to love kindness and to walk humbly with you, O Lord. For it's in Christ's name we pray and ask these things. Amen.